There are two themes which have dominated my adult life. A love of gambling and a love of wild animals. Give him a six. six so. From my earliest childhood, I had cherished a dream. One day, to protect and befriend some of the great mammals which had always stirred my imagination. I wonder why they took this. In the hope of getting a six. I realized that to accomplish such an ambition in the England of the 50s, I would need large sums of money. And the two ones. I soon discovered, for better or for worse, that nature had designed me as a gambler. And when at Oxford, I felt, for the first time, the cards in my hand, I knew that they would control my destiny. In 1956, I had a considerable win on a horse called Prelone in the Cesarewitz Stakes at Newmarket. This helped me to buy Howlitz, a modest estate in the heart of the Kent countryside and a suitable setting in which to raise wild animals. A constant supply of gambler's gold made it possible for me to sustain self-perpetuating breeding colonies of wild animals at Howlitz, the numbers of which grew by birth and acquisition as the years went by. Wild nature had always inspired me. The great mammals and their kindred fired my imagination. I was reluctant to accept the teachings of our own culture, which has encouraged us to despise the masterpieces of nature and to reserve our admiration for ourselves and for our own artifacts. The age-old man-made divide that has separated us from our closest relations, the high mammals, for thousands of years, just ceased to exist as far as I was concerned. I found wild animals to be trustworthy, emotionally predictable and above all, affectionate. Bonds were forged with many of these creatures no different in kind from the bonds a man makes with his close personal friends, with those he honors and in whom he places a special trust. The observations of modern ethologists confirm the structured and orderly nature of mammal societies. Mindless violence and senseless destruction are confined to humans. Yet ironically, it is mankind who has vilified and denigrated the animal world. Our very language is littered with epithets and expressions which refer to animals and nearly all are derogatory. The real likelihood of the legend of Little Red Riding Hood is that the grandmother ate the wolf and used its skin as a bed drug. <laughs> to reveal for myself and others the true nature of these animals was and remains my most exhilarating task. As the numbers of animals at Howlett's increased, a small nucleus of keepers was formed. Real animal men, frustrated with the attitude of most zoos, which forbade contact with animals, they welcomed the opportunity to work at Howlett's, where emotional bonding between keeper and kept was actually encouraged. Mm. 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 Mm.
Their daily work routine became unique by outside standards. Man and wild beast lived in a strange, almost Kipling-esque harmony in the English countryside. <laughs> no. In this atmosphere, and in the care of great keepers like Brian Stocks, who later died tragically, the animals thrived. They began to breed with a profusion which far exceeded our wildest hopes. From the smallest beginnings, Howlett's developed into one of the largest collections in the world. A breeding sanctuary for animals, many of extreme rarity, both in the wild state and in captivity. Safe from the depredations of the human race, they've been given every encouragement to breed, and most have done so. The plight of these creatures in the wild is so serious that zoos now have a grave responsibility. We must protect wild animals, not for our grandchildren's sake, but for the sake of their own grandchildren. No longer can zoos serve just to satisfy our curiosity. It is incumbent on them to allow their animals to breed, as for many species, it is the only hope of their survival. We never imagined in the beginning that the 50 acres of howlets would prove insufficient. But as the years passed and the animals increased in numbers, it soon became apparent that more land would be needed. In 1973, I bought an estate nearby, Port Lim, with its historic mansion and, more important, 300 acres of south-facing pasture for the herd animals. Together, Howlitz and Port Lim now shelter more than 80 species and a total of over 500 animals. The mansion of Port Lim was built during the First World War by Sir Herbert Baker for his patron, Sir Philip Sassoon. Sir Philip was the sitting member of Parliament for Folkestone and Hyde. When Private Secretary to Lloyd George, he arranged for the Treaty of Paris to be signed in the library which he had specially built for the occasion. Port Lim was a light-hearted plaisance where Sir Philip entertained his friends during August only. Between the wars, most of the political eminenti of that epoch spent part of August at Port Lim. Standing on its steep escarpment overlooking the English Channel, the estate is sheltered from northerly winds by belts of woodland and is watered by perennial springs. Here the animals enjoy a greater freedom.
To raise wild animals is to learn to love them and respect them. From these two ingredients can be distilled a reverence for the whole natural world whence we sprang and on which we depend for our existence. There's nothing more vital than to respect the animals in your care. Most people, of course, are ruled out on this score. Nothing will ever convince them that other creatures are anything but deeply inferior to themselves. A high mammal soon discerns this attitude in a human, and resentment breeds aggression or apathy. <laughs> Just as a human knows whether he is a prisoner or a guest, so does a mammal. It is essential to feel that they are as important as you are. In the presence of a creature such as a gorilla, this is not difficult. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know how they compare, but is it bigger? Yeah. It looks bigger. I think we have to remember that the gorilla was just as dominant in his natural habitat as was early man. And unlike ourselves, he has never gone on a rampage against nature. He has never destroyed his environment. In fact, where gorilla country is strong, where there are most gorillas, in gorilla strongholds, you usually see the maximum number of other life species. A tremendous compliment to the gorilla. Um, I think you can say the same of the tiger and the sperm whale. But they also are highly dominant um, at the apex of the faunal scale, and yet never destroyed, but seem to enhance their, their surrounding conditions, the environment, the natural world. It seems to be only man that has gone on a rampage against nature, destroying, in fact, the, the very tree that he's living on. The great overlords of nature seldom veered from the wide roles that they enjoyed. It is a strange irony that these evolutionary masterpieces can no longer protect themselves, that their destiny lies in our hands, in our capacity to extend to them our love and understanding as their future measures. That this should be so is an evolutionary miscarriage, but that it is so is inescapable. A classic example of a beneficial predator is the tiger. Untouched tiger wilderness amazed the early explorers for the quality and quantity of the game animals. Both were the work of Panthera tigris. Undisputed master of his range, he acted as a responsible overlord at the apex of the faunal scale, benefiting the animals he preyed upon and restraining rather than exploiting his awesome powers. If it is emotional honesty and predictability of temperament, capacity for loyalty and affection that we are looking for, then these we find in the tiger, along with an almost bottomless fund of good nature. In our experience, which covers a quarter of a century, about one tiger in 12 proves unreliable or untrustworthy a far lower proportion than in men. The two keepers who lost their lives at Harlots were killed by a Siberian tigress who could never be trusted. If a friendly animal had turned and killed for no known reason, I would have been dismayed and confounded. But the deaths of Brian Stocks and Bob Wilson in the jaws of Zaya have not diminished my faith in the character of the tiger. 
The exception underscores the rule. Corbett, the great hunter, said after a lifetime of harassing this cat that the tiger was indeed a gentleman. That such a creature should pass from the face of the earth at our doing or lack of doing is almost unthinkable. And yet, exactly that will come about, possibly within this century, unless enough of his friends and admirers come to his aid now before it is too late. People talk blithely about animal, animals and their rights animal rights. Well, the truth is, they have no rights because we've arrogated those rights to ourselves. Might is a right, and the human being is mighty, and he has taken to himself and upon himself all the rights that exist, or as many as he can get hold of. So he will then dispense rights to species from his own. And so, it's not that I'm saying they shouldn't have rights, but they really have none. And it's, it's childish to say animal rights, they've got, they've got their rights. The only rights they now have, so it seems, is what we're prepared to extend to them. From childhood, we're all bombarded with the rights of our own species. The rights of man, the Bill of Rights, civil rights, human rights, woman's rights. The concept of the sanctity of human life is probably the most damaging sophistry ever propagated. The cause of this damage is clearly seen when we examine its implicit corollary, the insanctity of all life other than human. Evolution, it is estimated, discards one species every thousand years. Mankind exterminates more than one species each month. So usurping the ultimate prerogative of deciding which shall live and which shall die. To enable him to go ahead with his war of attrition, man has raised himself to a godhead, Homo Imago Dei. The convenient myth readily endorsed by the three most influential religions Judeo-Christianity, Marxism, and Islam. It's been estimated that the Earth would take more than a hundred million years to recover from the human experience. The truth must be faced. Our species is short-sighted and incompetent to boot, and quite incapable of ruling the planet for its own benefit or anyone else's. Nature whose sweet rains fall on just and unjust alike, has much to teach those who are willing to learn from her. I fear that they will never be enough to deflect the present collision course of our civilization. But I know of no other wager more worth a bet. Let us grasp the gamble with both hands and pray for time and justice. Few animals in captivity present as many problems as the elephant. His vast bulk must be fed, his awesome power must find expression. Most zoos shy away from the task of trying to breed them. Even in Asia, where the culture of training elephants is thousands of years old, no consistent breeding has ever been accomplished in captivity. They do not reproduce until the age of 14 and will only respond to a keeper they've known all their life. This is particularly true of adult bulls whose intractability is proverbial. Despite these obvious difficulties, we have an Indian group at Port Lim and an African herd at Howlett's 
which have been with us since the age of two or three and have now reached breeding age. We procured Chibi because we thought that she would have um, an encouraging effect on the females as far as breeding is concerned. On the stone egg theory that if you put a stone egg into a chicken's nest then the chicken is encouraged to lay real eggs. So she is our stone egg and we hope that she will um, get the oestrogen hormone flowing in the females so that um, they come into season and ovulate and certainly the males do their bit, particularly Buana here. Uh, has mated several times with Massa. And we have high hopes of a baby in the next few years. Um, the whole object of keeping this group is to form a breeding group of African elephants. And um, there's been no birth ever recorded in the UK of an African elephant. So it'd be a great occasion if we can manage it, but it's difficult. One of the problems is that few zoos keep bulls. I think in the whole of the United Kingdom there's only six bull elephants and four of them are with us. Two African and we have two Indian bulls in the Indian herd at Port Lim. Elephants, bull and cow, kill one keeper a year this century. Over 18 known deaths of keepers. So it's risky and as these bulls get bigger um, they might cause us problems. Yeah, what is it, colourless or colourless? In the summer of 1981, we thought that Marza might be pregnant from Buana. She's definitely yeah. She's on the way. Yes, Absolutely. Because we've got a, a female of exactly the same age to make the contrast. Several experts visited Howlitz and confirmed our diagnosis. Prominent among them was Dr. Ernst Lang of Baal a pioneer in the field of elephant breeding. I mean, she, is, she is approachable, she's just going to take an awful lot of time about it, but she will not have the press felt I at see. all, I not see. at all. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think this zoo is very different from most of the other zoos because it's built by an animal lover. All the other zoos are built for the people. This zoo is built for the animals and for their welfare. Especially in the regard to the elephants, I think it's a very important work which is done here. Uh, if you compare, if you look at the circumstances in, in Uganda or in East Africa, uh, especially the last few uh, years, nearly all the elephants have been killed, have been poached and uh, the African elephant is one of the rarest animals now. And so even with a small group like this one here, it's very important to uh, try to breed African elephants to save them from extinction. On the morning of the 25th of May, 1982, after what to us had seemed an eternity, Maza produced Sabi, the first African elephant ever to have been born in Britain. The first dividend of a 10-year program. The calf that cost us a million dollars, but worth to us a multiple of that sum. A heifer calf as well, and in Maza, a perfect mother.
our cup was indeed full. The birth of Sabi was the most joyous event since the birth of Basha, our first black rhinoceros calf, and comparable in our own estimation of importance with the birth of Kijo, our first gorilla, in 1975. What was so exciting was the fact that we had another nubile cow, Bila, to breed from. Bila had been mated with Toto and Buana, Sabi's father, so we feel another elephant birth is on the cards in the near future. It never pays to um, disturb a tiger or a tigress when they're feeding. If I went towards um, Putra now, went too close, she'd curse at me. And it's one of the first lessons that the cubs have to learn, even from their own mother, is not to disturb her when she's feeding. The tiger spends about 17 hours a day resting or sleeping. I remember when I first visited a tigress with newborn cubs, I was a little apprehensive. Popular belief had left lingering doubts as to the nature of my welcome. A tigress in the presence of her cubs was supposed to be ferocity incarnate. Needless to say, my fears were soon dispelled. These cubs are a month old tomorrow, and um, she's quite happy now to let them outside for periods like this. She brings them out herself sometimes, and um, at the moment I'm acting as babysitter for her. She's over there, 30, 40 feet away, leaving it all to me. Probably get some um, relief. It's the fifth litter that uh, this mother has had. She's never lost a cub, so she's a model mother, really. There's one male in this group, and he's much bigger than the others. It's a real handful. Here he is. Even at this age, we can, we can tell whether they're likely to be reliable or not. 
About 10 out of 11 of these cubs make steady tigers. Here comes mother. She probably heard that squawk. In man, of course, the tiger has found his nemesis. Deforestation and development, along with roads, railways, and the rifle, have all but sealed his fate. The tiger has one last card to play before he disappears forever. He has in him the capacity to arouse in us admiration and affection. Were his nature and qualities known to enough of us, his future would be assured. I think there is a real purpose for zoos, good zoos that can form self-perpetuating breeding colonies, very much so today, because a zoo, such a zoo that can form a colony of tigers or gorillas or any other species that's threatened, um, serves as a holdback area in a very difficult time for these animals, so that in the next 10, 20, 30, 40, or 100 years, animals can be taken from the zoos and put back into the wild, into, into, into the wild where they came from. Already there is talk of putting Sowalski's horses back into the Altai steppes of Mongolia from the horses bred in captivity and that's now extinct in the wild. So if they hadn't been bred in zoos, uh, the Sowalski horse would have disappeared completely. Same applies, of course, to the Pear David's deer, which uh, was saved by Pear David in the last century, brought to Europe and bred in large numbers, and is now safe. And is back in China, where it became extinct. Um, and there are many examples of this, and there'll be more and more. Um, Billy Singh has rehabilitated a tigress back into the wild as pioneering work. And that tigress came from a zoo. In fact, the tigresses came from Twycross Zoo. And I think the, um, the, grandfa the grandfather and grandmother on its paternal side came from Howlitz. So there's obviously um, a rationale behind breeding animals. But we don't breed them for our curiosity or, uh, or for medical knowledge or anything like that, but purely to conserve them in a group in as natural conditions as possible, so that one day in the future, they can be put back. The Savolsky, or Mongolian horse, is the only breed of wild horse left in the world and is probably extinct in the wild state. They cannot be broken and are famed for the hardness of their hooves and their stamina. The herd stallion is incredibly brave. If the herd is pursued by hunters, he brings up the rear, driving his mares and foals away to safety before him. In extremis, he will turn and charge his tormentors knowing full well that his life will be forfeit. He drives away his offspring when only a year or two old, as he knows that the herd size must be kept down if the group is to survive the harsh conditions on the Altai Plains during the Mongolian winter.
Although Sobolski stallions have a low fertility rate, our reigning stallion, Ulan, regularly gets his mares in foal and herd numbers swell accordingly. Only in San Diego Zoo before the war and in Baal in the 60s has it been possible to put two adult male gorillas together. So the site of Mumba and Jum in the big enclosure at Howlett's is an unusual one. They generally give each other a wide berth, but even on the rare occasions that they do come to blows, the bonds of friendship are strong enough to ensure that they come to no harm. The gorilla is a vegetarian. In the rainforest, he's known to eat more than 200 sorts of food. At Howlett's, we supply them with about 120 varieties, many of them seasonal. We can only spare one banana tree a year, grown in our hothouse. This is a special treat and the whole plant is dismembered and eaten. The griller is a true gourmet an adept at judging the quality of his fare. The greatest enemy of the gorilla in a zoo is boredom. Like man, he's a social animal and only finds full expression in a large family or band. At Howlett's, we can run up to 19 gorillas together and so can observe the variety of natural behavior that such large groupings encourage. To my knowledge, Jum is the only adult male gorilla in captivity that tolerates and even enjoys human company. We make a point of never soliciting him for play, but wait until he approaches us, until he makes the opening move. Any other course might invite his displeasure. Successful mood interpretation is vital when one enters the enclosure of a powerful mammal. On occasions, one's life may well depend on it. Heroic in his power and strength, magnificent in his self-possession, the great gorilla has always seemed to me the embodiment of Rousseau's dream of the noble savage. It seems incredible that nature has combined in his person such strength and such restraint.
In times when male dominance and paternalism are unfashionable concepts, it is revealing to look at the great male silverback gorilla, overlord and patriarch of his family and master of his clan. Benign, tolerant, good-natured he may be, but these qualities are merely an expression of the confidence he has in his own power. Beneath the awning of his cyclopean strength and within the confines of his wisdom and experience, the whole bevy of wives and dependents find refuge. The place of safety is that nearest to him. Beneath his ever-watching eyes, inside his brow-ridged gaze, the family can play in safety, forage and carouse. The character of the whole family will take its tone from the overlord, and in this the variation is probably as great as in prehistorical human societies, when the extended family was the natural unit. That we have much to learn from the great gorilla is as obvious as the fact that we are unable to do so. Inside that tragic irony, perhaps, can our future and theirs be measured. The early explorers led us to believe that the gorilla was a fierce antagonist, ready to charge and close with his pursuers. Today, the conventional wisdom is that the gorilla is a shy, retiring, meek giant. The huge physique of the male must have been, over the millennia, an adaptive response for the procurement and retention of wives on the one hand, and equally important to the defense of the band against the human hunting tribes on the other. I have little doubt that the gorilla, if pursued, would turn on his assailants. With the advent of firearms, however, he must have learned to make off silently and not to expose himself to a volley of bullets. Well, Sam, you finish. I will have an eyelash left. He's trying to pick some eyelashes out of me. He loves my eyelashes. This isn't a token of affection at the moment. It's just acquisition. He wants to eat my eyelashes. And I can't really spare too many. He's had a couple. I'm sure you're looking at the only male gorilla, adult male gorilla in the world, whom anyone would allow to pick their eyelashes like this, but he's a very reliable, he's a very good boy. He's the largest male we have. He's the father of that baby up on the top of that nest there with the mother. And also he's got another female pregnant here, Mushy, who's over there. So he's a breeding male, and he's um, knocking at the door at 400 pounds now. He is um, unimaginably strong. Um, and even when he's being at his gentlest, <laughs> like now, um, you still feel the incredible force of his strength. And these play bites, they're play bites, but I can tell you, <laughs> even through this sort of battle dress I'm wearing, <laughs> quite painful. And when I have a bath every evening, I see the marks. But um, he's probably exerting. 5% of his bite and about 2% of his strength when he plays with us. Otherwise, we couldn't do it. He always was a remarkable ape, was Jum, and I think he deserves to be 
uh, famous, to be honest. From his one year old, he was a character. And now he wants this. All right, he can have it. <laughs> no, you can have it. Go on. <laughs> That's the only weapon I go in with, which is my clippers. So I cut herbs for the, um, for the gorillas with. And um, if ever I'm under too much pressure, I do give a gorilla a clout with this. <laughs> and also with the tigers, I go in with that. <laughs> he said, you can take that thing away. <laughs> do you want it? Go on then. Have it. <laughs> no, I want this. Oh. Oh. Those who know the gorilla well, and they are but few, cannot bear the thought of his passing. Have we no place to offer man's elder brother, as Darwin described him? Have we nothing to learn from his example, from his wisdom? Has all sense of awe and wonder deserted us? Have we become such strangers to justice that we can deny him his rights, and refuse to render back to him at least a portion of what was once his own? Is he not symbolic to us of the majesty and dignity of the natural world? Proof indeed of our own identity as a species. Companion of our past, shared together in the African rainforest. And most important of all, we hope, talisman of our future. In the not so far distant future, all else being equal in a risky world, we could provide whole families of gorillas to return to the Gabon or to the Cameroons or to Zaire or to Northern Angola. Wherever we were convinced that there was protection or a strong chance of protection. Um, but these really are dreams. The general trend is against all this. The pressure on the wild creatures is so great that anything we do in captivity in terms of breeding them must be a step in the right direction, possibly the only direction for them, for many species. So I'm a great pessimist because I have to be a realist. And though, fortunately, I'm endowed with a romantic ability to dream, which keeps me going, and a sense of destiny, which I have, always have had, that it was my role, once I had amassed a little money, to try and protect my friends, the great mammals. Even so, I recognize, um, reality fights with romantic sentiment always a struggle in me. And um, it's exactly in that struggle that my contribution, if any, will be measured. <laughs>